And good day, everybody, and how are you? Nice to have you with us here on High Heat. Ian and all the fellas, Mitch Green today, Liberty Mutual, with yours truly as we discuss what's going on as far as baseball is concerned this little minor lot. Number one, I'm confident, I really am, after the developments the last 48 hours that we will have baseball uh, in 2020. How, where, when, who knows? But I am confident that there will be some formulation of a season. Obviously, the amount of games, you know, we're guessing if we're going to go in that direction right now. But I do believe that this year they will have a season. They will have an expanded playoff. I think that will happen as well, I, which is what I have no problem with this year. Do anything you want. I think you have different rule changes. I think you're going to have a universal DH. I think you play around a little bit in the 10th inning. I think you play around with seven inning double headers. Um, I think the sides, a little kumbaya moment in the last two days, which is what we needed. And I think the most important thing right now in a sport is to make sure that when they get a deal together, and I think they will, that, you know, they, you know, they say good things about each other. I think America and the sport fan right now wants to feel good about the return of their favorite sport, NBA, NHL, and baseball. A baseball fan wants to feel good. Hey, they're back. They want to be back. Everybody's on the same page, and let's go. I think that's important. And I think the both sides know that, so I think you'll see a little of that kumbaya stuff uh, as we get here a little closer to a actual signed agreement and, of course, uh, down the road of spring training. But I do think you're going to have a season. I really do. I think it's going to be, you know, east against east in the divisions. I think there'll be very little travel. I think the obviously what we read about in the last, you know, 12, 13 weeks will come to fruition as far as, you know, sequestering with hotels and Yankees against the Mets and the Yankees this year won't play the, you know, Rockies or they won't play, say, a team like Seattle. I think that will all come to pass. But I do think you're going to have a – I think the amount of games is tricky. You know, somewhere between 60 and 70 games would be my best guess. And it's only a guess. So don't really go – don't etch it in stone. But I think somewhere in that department – and I think you have 30 teams. I think you're going to have 16 in the postseason. I think you have a best of three. I do not think they will go past September 27th. So if they do play the 68, 70 games or more so, I think you have a lot of double headers, which I'm okay with. We need the game back. Lower the temperature. I think the temperature has been high in the world. We all know that. I think it's been high in baseball. I know that. We need to lower the temperature a little bit and get everybody on the same page of being baseball fans. And I think we have seen developments in the last 24, 48 hours that we are on that path. And I think that path will continue. And I'm not gonna hesitate to think, you know, somewhere around that third weekend in July, you know, July, take a pick. Between 18th of July and the 25th of July, I think you have play ball first pitch. That's what I think. So let's keep our fingers crossed that's the case. The Ken Griffey documentary here on the MLB Network will be Sunday night. It will be outstanding. Dave Valley, of course, a teammate, and then later a broadcaster for that Seattle Mariner organization. And, of course, part of the network, MLB Network family says hello on this uh, busy late June day. Hello, Dave. How are you today, pal? Okay? Doing great, Mad Dog. How are you doing over there? Always a pleasure. Thanks for getting up. Appreciate that, too. First sight of Griffey, late 80s. Did you know you were looking at a Hall of Famer or not? I don't know if I was looking at a Hall of Famer, but I was looking at a special human being, a special person, a special talent. I remember when he first signed and he came to do the workout at the Kingdom, uh, myself, Alvin Davis, and Harold were sitting in the dugout watching this kid swing a baseball bat. And, and he went from there to just walk into the outfield. And I remember thinking, he belongs here. I mean, this kid was born to play in the major leagues, just the way he carried himself with the confidence that he had at the age of 17 years old, you knew that he wasn't, uh, wasn't going to be long before he joined us in Seattle. And I know a lot of veteran players, when a big Holly uh, uh, Ballyhooed rookie comes in, there's a little, skept a little cynicism, a little skepticism. They want to see how good the guy is. But the Mariners were not a great team. And Griffey had his dad, so you knew the genes were good. So probably when he arrived at such a young age, as a teenager, uh, there was not any jealousy. You knew you were getting a big-time player, right? No, I don't think there was any jealousy. Uh, I know not certainly not on my part because I was looking at Junior like, this is a guy that can kind of take us as a team, as a city, to the next level. And uh, what he did at the age of 19, think about this. Where were you, Mad Dog, when you were 19 years old? I was, a, you, I was a sophomore in college. The, the yeah. national, I don't even want to know. But could you imagine having to handle the national press coming out on the cover of Sports Illustrated with the natural at the bottom of it, 
and still going out there and performing at the age of 19. It was an absolute marvel for me as a veteran player at that time to watch him perform night in and night out and uh, just carry himself with such style and grace out there. Was he further along offensively or defensively, Dave? Say that one more time. Was he further along offensively or defensively? I think defensively. Junior was a type of defensive player that if the ball went in the air, he was going to catch it. He played with such a reckless abandon out there. I mean, the, the AstroTurf in the kingdom was about an inch thick, and then it was concrete. And he tore up more uniform pants. And back then, you didn't have a lot of pants, right? You, had, you were given two sets. So our clubhouse guy had to shake, had to uh, continue to sew patches on his pants and then patches on top of the patches because he's sliding out there on the turf. He's running into walls. Uh, you know, the, the, the highlight reel itself just kind of shows you what type of player and the way he played the game day, daily uh, it was just amazing to me. All right, you retire and then you go to the broadcast booth. So your relationship with Griffey changes. Give me some thoughts on that for a sec. Go ahead. Uh, you know, Junior and I, we go way back. When he was 19, he, he bought a house real close to myself. Uh, he would show up every day, like right around noon, to, to say, hey, hey, guys, how you doing? Oh, you having lunch? But um, he, he, he was a kid that I kind of felt like we really bonded at that age. He was living in Seattle at 19 and 20 years old, didn't have a lot of friends at that point in time. And he was, I think he was somebody that felt comfortable being around us. Becoming the broadcaster now, uh, just to watch him from the booth every night when he really kind of hit his stride in the mid-90s, uh, hitting 56 home runs two years in a row. It was just incredible to continue to see him get better from the first four years that I played with him. You know, listen, I know he wanted to go home, uh, but in hindsight, it was probably not the great. He should have stayed, right? I mean, he should have been a Mariner his whole life. The Red situation, they were not a good team. He was looked at as a savior. That makes it tricky. Probably at the end of the day, if everybody could do it over again, he would have remained with Seattle. What's your take on that? Let me hear. Yeah, I think that would have been an ideal situation. Certainly for me as a broadcaster, I didn't want to see Junior leave anywhere. Uh, you know, he goes to Cincinnati, hits, I think, 40 in his first year over in Cincinnati. So it wasn't like it was a bust, but then the injuries came. And you look at his career numbers during the prime of his career. He lost probably – close to three to four full years of playing time, yet his numbers were still Hall of Fame numbers without any question about it. But, uh, you know, the game I thought was robbed because of some of those injuries that he had while he was in Cincinnati. A hundred percent. Now, he was great in the kingdom. Now, he, when he hit it, he was going to hit it anyway. But how about that small little ballpark indoors for his swing, Dave? Give me some thoughts. It was, there. It was absolutely perfect. You know, I, I always used to get on him and say, Hey, Junior, when are you going to win a batting title? Because in my mind, the way, the talent that he had, if he wanted to win a batting title, he could have won multiple batting titles. But I think that, that inviting porch in the kingdom got him to start pulling the ball a little bit more as he got bigger and stronger as his body filled out. Now, I know you went to Safeco halfway through a year. I don't think you started the season there. So that was an adjustment. Let me hear your thoughts there for a sec. Go ahead. It was a slight adjustment, but for somebody like Junior with the type of power that he had, uh, it wasn't that big of an adjustment. I'll give you a quick story. So he ends up going to Cincinnati, and they actually come to Safeco Field to play the Seattle Mariners. And it was the first time he was coming back, and uh, I got a couple of seats right behind the visitor's dugout. So my son and I go to the dugout to say hi to him, and he's late. He's not even at the ballpark. So it's about – it's a 1 o'clock game, so it's about 12-15 – he comes walking into the dugout, and I see him. He's still in his street clothes, and he's talking to me, me and my son, Philip, and they're, they're talking. I'm looking at my watch. I'm going, I said, Junior, you, the game's in 30 minutes because I started seeing some of his guys coming out to stretch. He's like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. And he kept talking. He kept talking. It's 22. I said, I'm leaving. You need to go get changed. He comes out that day and hits two home runs, did not pick up a bat, did not prepare or prep. Wow. I'm play. He just he just played the game with such a freedom, Mad Dog, that I had never seen that before. When I played, I grinded. I grinded to get to the big leagues. I grinded to stay there. He played because he loved it, and he played so freely. It was just a beautiful thing to watch. One of the all-time greats. Dave, great job. Thanks for getting up. You keep up the good work. Appreciate you coming out here today. My pleasure, guys. Mr. Valley, well done, Griffey. We look forward to that Sunday night on the MLB Network. You see your time there. 
at 8 o'clock. You know they do a great job with those things. Dave Parker, the Cardinals, they do a great job on those things. And that will be well watched, well done. All right, we will uh, see you next time. Good job, of course, from Ian today, who filled in. Always a pleasure. And our good buddy is Mitch Green. Uh, Liberty Mutual, of course. We will see you down the road. Adios.